When I hear the term biblical archaeology, Indiana Jones immediately springs to mind, mostly because the two best Indiana Jones movies happen to involve artifacts mentioned in the Bible. But archaeology in practice looks a lot different from archaeology on screen. There are no booby-trapped boulders or bombs. Instead, most archaeologists spend their time at libraries, labs, and archaeological sites, where they sift through material remains to reveal how people lived, worked, ate, socialized, and worshipped. And when it comes to biblical archaeology, well, that opens up a whole new set of issues. See, archaeology is the study of material remains, and the Bible, obviously, is a text. In the family of archaeology, a lot of professionals view biblical archaeology as an odd sibling because it's a field that allows a text to set the agenda allows a text to set the questions we ask of the material data. However, as the archaeologist Aaron Brody argues, archaeology is notoriously bad at answering questions related to short-term or political history. The lifetime of any one individual is brief, and rarely, if ever, leaves behind archaeological traces. So, even a biblical character as famous or infamous as King Saul is almost impossible to find in the material record. What archaeology is good at is answering other types of questions related to medium and long-term histories, such as questions about society, economics, religion, resource procurement, farming. From excavations at these sites, researchers can piece together information about a bunch of different aspects of daily life, such as how did they manufacture their pottery? Who did they trade with? What crops did they farm? What animals did they domesticate? What did their houses look like? Topics rarely covered in biblical texts. Archaeology is less equipped to detail the sort of exciting stories we see in the Bible. Abraham's travels from Ur to Canaan, the exploits of Samson versus the Philistines, royal rivalries between King Saul and the future King David. For that information, we have to disentangle the texts and textual layers preserved in the Hebrew Bible, texts that are often written centuries after the events they describe. In this series, we will examine what archaeology reveals about the cultures mentioned in the Bible, and while we'll discuss the biblical text when it's relevant, I want to focus primarily on the material evidence. But first, we have to look at the discipline's earliest explorers, whose discoveries, methods, and theories forever changed the way we think about the Bible. Let's start with someone that many consider to be the father of biblical archaeology, the 19th century biblical scholar and minister Edward Robinson. Like many of his peers, he viewed the Bible as a fundamentally historical document, a key to unlocking the biblical past. And his theological training motivated him to seek out evidence for biblical sites, people, and events on the ground as a way to prove the veracity of the Bible. So, equipped with the Bible in one hand and a map in the other, Robinson set out for the Holy Land in 1838 on a mission to identify the location of places mentioned in the Bible. And he was pretty good at it. He and his team identified a bunch of archaeological sites by matching modern Arabic place names with their hypothesized ancient Hebrew names, names as they would have been known in the biblical text. A famous example is the town that in Arabic is called Beitin, which Robinson identified as Bethel or Beit El in Hebrew, where the patriarch Jacob famously saw a vision of God and angels in the book of Genesis. In both of these closely related Semitic languages, the place names share the linguistic root Beit, meaning house. Robinson was also an expert map maker, and using modern scientific methods of survey to map the Holy Land, he helped to professionalize the emerging field of what was then called biblical geography. Equipped with his surveying tools and Bible, he and his team eventually identified around 100 biblical places. Robinson was not alone in his methods of tracking down ancient places using a text as his guide. The German explorer Heinrich Schliemann wanted to identify ancient Greek places mentioned in the works of Homer. And with the Iliad in one hand and his shovel in the other, Schliemann went on a self-appointed quest to dig up the famous city of Troy. However, while Schliemann would always have been faced with the potential that Troy was a mythical place from Homer's imagination, 
early Holy Land theologian explorers like Robinson understood the Bible as beyond question. Although Robinson was pretty successful, he did miss some of the major biblical towns, including Joshua's Jericho and Lachish, the site of a famous battle between King Hezekiah's forces and the Assyrians. Unlike the example of Bethel, the modern Arabic names of these places did not bear any resemblance to their biblical Hebrew counterparts. He failed to identify these famous biblical cities because he did not understand the phenomenon of tells. The ruins of long-lived ancient settlements often appear today in the shape of tall mounds or hills that in Arabic and Hebrew are called tells. Remember, Robinson was living during the infancy of archaeology as a modern academic discipline, and some of the basic principles that archaeologists now take for granted were not yet established. One of these tenets is the principle of superposition, which sounds pretty fancy, but it's a really simple idea. This principle holds that in any accumulation of stuff, the layers at the bottom are the oldest, with each layer progressively younger in ascending order toward the top. So think of tells as a layer cake in the shape of a tall trapezoid-shaped mound. As humans live in one place, century after century, the material remains of daily life build up layer on top of layer. These superimposed layers, known in archaeology as stratigraphic levels, record the history of a settlement from its oldest remains at the base to its youngest at the top. Although this might just look like a big hill of boring dirt, these layers contain artifacts in their original context that archaeologists excavate, analyze, and interpret to understand the past. Robinson was among the first biblical archaeologists, inspiring an entire generation of late 19th century explorers to launch a frenzied search for traces of biblical civilizations. A few of these finds were huge sensations in their time. For example, check out this object, the so-called Mesha Stele found in Jordan. This stone inscription, which dates to the 9th century BCE, is written in Moabite, an ancient Semitic language of the Iron Age people of the land of Moab mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. And what was so special about the inscription? Well, the inscription records the accomplishments and defeats of King Mesha of Moab, including a reference to Moab's subjugation at the hands of Omri, king of Israel, the very same king mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. So, by naming an entity called Israel and its king as Omri, the Mesha Stele confirmed the existence of an Israelite king who reigned in the 800s BCE. It is a hugely valuable object for historians because it shows the Moabite perspective of the same account that is presented from the Israelite perspective in 2 Kings. The discovery of the Mesha Stele in the 1800s sent shockwaves through the field of biblical studies. Biblical scholars viewed it as a smoking gun for the veracity of the Bible, an extra-biblical source that confirmed a historical event in the Bible. But not so fast. There's a flip side to exciting discoveries like this. Archaeology's potential to contradict the biblical text. If it could prove the text, archaeology could also challenge it and raise questions about the historicity of the Bible. As gaps between the text and archaeology came to light, archaeologists began to question a Bible-centric approach to their research. Yes, Robinson's legacy still looms large in the fields of biblical studies and biblical archaeology, but today's archaeologists are less interested in proving the stories of the Bible and more interested in understanding the context of the biblical world. Many scholars have turned toward new approaches rooted in anthropology, motivated to understand broader social and historical questions that relate little, if at all, to the Bible. Let's start with how archaeologists identify and excavate archaeological sites. While excavation is probably the most famous archaeological practice, archaeologists need to identify sites to dig up in the first place. This is done in a bunch of different ways, but archaeological survey is the most well-known. Because we're dealing with thousands of years of history, ancient settlements might be covered by modern construction or be buried deep underground by centuries of accumulated remains, such as layers of trash, debris, and natural buildup of sediment from erosion and water. In order to identify these sites, archaeologists conduct pedestrian surveys, which involves teams of archaeologists walking across open terrain collecting archaeological finds from the surface. They also conduct aerial surveys, using visual and multispectral imaging from drones and satellites. 
and geophysical survey methods, such as ground-penetrating radar and magnetometry, both of which can help an archaeologist figure out what might lie buried underground. Once an area of ancient remains is identified, the next step is excavation. Excavation involves digging targeted areas with the goal of finding out the basic history of the site through analyzing its stratigraphy, meaning the site's superimposed layers that I mentioned earlier. The order of the layers from top to bottom can be dated using techniques like tree ring dating, radiocarbon dating, and dating with pottery forming a sequence of pottery types and then matching them up across different sites. The archaeologist Cynthia Schaefer Elliott uses the example of smartphones. If you're an Apple iPhone fan, you can probably identify what year a certain iPhone dates to. The styles change subtly from year to year. In the same way, archaeologists can date pieces of pottery based on style or material. Together, this evidence enables archaeologists to determine when, for how long, by whom, and how a site was used. Was it used for habitation, trash, industrial activities, food processing, farming, storage, burial, or many other possibilities? The next step is analyzing the finds that are actually collected during excavation. We humans leave behind a lot of stuff. I often think about how plastics will be an important artifact for future archaeologists to understand life in the 21st century, because a plastic object can take hundreds and hundreds of years to decompose in a landfill. When it comes to ancient contexts, archaeologists start by identifying the object's material stone, ceramic, bone, or metal, as well as the artifact's typology, meaning how an artifact can be classified into categories. Specialists can conduct more detailed analyses of objects, looking for clues about how it was made, where the source material came from, and marks that show wear and tear and repairs. So for a graphic example, bone experts determined that the Philistines ate dogs since they identified marks on dog bones from Philistine sites that showed that the dog was butchered by humans for consumption. At the cutting edge is microarchaeology, the study of archaeological remains at the microscopic level. Microarchaeology has helped us reconstruct the diets of ancient people in particular. Paleobotany involves identifying preserved plant remains, often in the form of charred seeds and pits. This information tells us what plants people were farming, foraging, and eating, or what plants they were using as material for crafting or clothing. Other techniques try to reveal new insights on the chemical level. So one example would be residue analysis, which is a way of identifying what organic materials a vessel may have contained. The idea is that stable molecules like fatty acids seep into the pores of the clay and are preserved for centuries. These molecules are extracted and analyzed to determine what materials that vessel must have contained. So, for example, at the site of Tel Megiddo, a recent residue analysis of a juglet from the Middle Bronze Age found the world's earliest known use of vanillin the main aromatic and flavor compound in vanilla. The study turned previous research on vanilla on its head. So archaeologists used to think that vanilla was first domesticated by the Aztecs in the 1300s. But this new evidence instead changed everything. Vanilla must have first been domesticated 3,000 years earlier and halfway across the globe in Southwest Asia. These are just a few examples of the potential of archaeology to change the narrative of history pushing the boundaries of current knowledge of ancient peoples, and challenging the status quo of biblical history. Over the course of this series, we'll examine different topics related to the Bible. In some cases, like the Canaanites and the Philistines, the Bible tells us so little that archaeology gives these people groups a new voice for the first time in centuries. We'll be starting in the middle to late Bronze Age, so stay tuned for episode 2, The Canaanites. Hey everyone, that was episode one of a new series that I'm producing in collaboration with Pathios. It's called Excavating the History of the Bible. You can watch episode two right now, so just head on over to Pathios's brand new YouTube channel. You can subscribe and follow the whole series as we launch each episode weekly. Topics will include who were the Canaanites, where did the Israelites come from, who were the Philistines, e examining the cultures and places mentioned in the Bible from an anthropological and archaeological perspective. So each and every episode is written by an archaeologist or a biblical scholar, so special thanks to all the awesome people down in the credits below. I could not have made this series without their help. So head on over to Pathios' YouTube channel to watch episode 2, Who Were the Canaanites?